Welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. I'm Stephanie Hupka, and I am a past president of the Metro DC chapter of ATD. Hi, I'm Christina Eanes, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications. We also have Helena Hodges, our Vice President of Finance and Operations, as our producer. And for this episode, we are very excited to be interviewing Dr. Patty Phillips. Welcome, Patty. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today and excited to chat with you. Well, we are really looking forward to this conversation. This is one of my favorite topics, so I am really thrilled to be able to pick your brain for a little while. But before we jump in, we would love it if you would tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure, happy to. So Patty Phillips, CEO of ROI Institute. My husband and I started our business about 25 years ago, and it's all built around the process that Jack developed back in the 1970s when he was at Lockheed. Um, so we have expanded the process, applied it in talent development and HR and marketing, humanitarian programs. And so it's just a, the type of work that we love to do. Um, we work in about 70 countries and we are so happy that travel is back because while we mm. love being together for two and a half years, um, <laughs> we realized a week ago when we did our first non-US, our first international trip, we realized just how much we do love to get out and be with people, right? Yes. So but that's what we do. So happy to be here. Oh, it is, well, that's the best part. It really is about the connections and getting a chance to see people and feel like you have a chance to make a difference with them. So, well, we're thrilled you're here. And I know, you know, as far as ROI is concerned, so, you know, we're talking about return on investment today. It's very important within organizations. We often are hearing our leadership talk about it. There are often priorities that are built around ROI. We don't always hear ROI mentioned in the training space. And so I'd love to start there. Tell us a little bit about why ROI is so important to training. Yeah. Well, it's, it's important training for a variety of reasons. First, it's, very, it's fundamental to the business. You do t hear about it from your senior executives. You hear about it in operations and marketing. You hear about it across the board. Um, so knowing it and being familiar with it is important because it does come up in conversation. So I think it's important mm -hmm. to know it. And it's important to know exactly what it is and what it's not. So when we talk about ROI, we're talking about most fundamental measure that demonstrates the benefits of programs to the cost. So classic earnings compared to investment times 100 gives you a percentage. Um, we look at net benefits compared to cost times 100 gives you that percentage. And in that one metric, you can learn how the benefits of a program or process compare using money as the normalizer, because too often we say, well, you know, productivity improved and we're going to go with that. Well, how much should it cost you to get that productivity to improve? And what's the value of that productivity? Because if you spend a million dollars, you know, $950,000 and you can't tell what happened with that money in terms that are actually comparable to the spend, you struggle, right? Because a lot of times, you know, the intangible, um, is not so clear. So with that metric, you can really show benefits to cost. You're normalizing your benefits and um, make that connection. So it's crystal clear. Now that said, um, we use it different ways. It's classically used to help inform resource allocation. So when you're trying to make decisions where to put your money, um, what programs are working, what which ones aren't, um, where we shift the money. So it's classic use of ROI and cost benefit analysis. But what we always want to remember, it is just one measure. It is telling us quantitatively how we're doing. The other measures that we're so familiar with in learning and development, you know, behavior change, application, learning, um, even reaction data at the end of the program, those measures give that ROI context and they also inform improvement opportunities because it's all about how do we give the best development opportunity to the people in the organization. So it's all about process improvement. Um, it doesn't mean that, for example, negative ROIs don't mean you're going to cut the program. Negative ROIs mean it's not paying off financially 
let's back up to these lower levels of data and see what's happening, what's not, and see if we can adjust it. Now, some things do need to go. A lot of times it's just a matter of adjusting the program, getting the right people in the program. So it's important to talent development because it is fundamental to the business. It's also important because it's a critical metric to help inform Resource allocation questions, you know, decision making around that is also important because in today's environment, you know, we're facing another recession. We've got inflation. This thing doesn't stop, right? I mean, there's always some issue that puts funding at risk and it is a really good tool to help say, you know what, that leadership development is worth continuing or it is worth expanding to others in the organization. It just gives us some insight that we often don't get when all we do is collect reaction data. And again, Mm -hmm. not discounting reaction data, but you know, if you're not asking good questions at that level, it's not useful either. So you just, we just want to be familiar with it. You want to use it. We use it selectively. We don't use it for every program, although you could. Uh, We don't. We look at the big investments and it's just a really good tool to have in the talent development toolbox because it can explain so much in a single little metric and then Mm. use the other data to provide context and improvement opportunities. Oh, I love, I love that. Um, I love how it's multi-layered and I do have to confess when I first learned about ROI many years ago, when I first got into the training industry, it was scary for me. And I, and I'm guessing that is uh, like a typical reaction. Are there typical reactions or um, myths essentially, that you come up against uh, that you have found? Sure. First, we hear a lot of times you can't do it. Well, you can. You know, we've got 110 books that tell you you can. It's been around for a long time. You can. So that's silly. Yeah. Um, so there's that myth out there because it can be. Um, the other thing is people are concerned that, you know, if they're not math people, they can't do it. It does not have mm. to be hard. We live in an era of analytics, you know, big data and all that. Yeah. Math is math. It's not, you don't have to be a data scientist to do this. I mean, anyone can do it. And if for some reason you're not comfortable doing it, there are a lot of people who can help. So it doesn't have to be that difficult. The other thing is people will tell us, oh, it's too expensive. Not really. Not if you're at risk of losing a program because you can't demonstrate value, right? I mean, it's just, it's not that expensive. We can do an ROI study for 5 to 10% of the program cost max. I mean, you can do that, especially if you build capability in it. So, you know, it's just, you know, people are out there and it's like, you know, a lot of things. They they don't, they're misinformed, they're uninformed, they don't want to do it. And when we don't want to do things, we say bad things about it. It can't be done. It really can be. Again, do we do it for everything? No. You don't because you can spend more on evaluation than the program and you never want to do that. Um, You look at it as a tool to demonstrate value for the major investments you're making in your people. So we've got to look at big investments, leadership programs, technology implementation, that new LMS. Let's do a forecast ROI to see if there's really value there. Um, Some things we're just going to do for our people because it's nice to do. Nothing wrong with that. We're just not going to evaluate it to ROI. So does that help? I'm curious, Christina, why why were you afraid of it? I am curious about that. Yeah. So this was in the 90s. Um, and new to the field, right? And I, I, several reasons for being one, it was big and it seemed like, how do I put a dollar sign on this? And then uh, the other thing was, you know, the worry of what's kind of one of the first things that goes in an organization is the training. <laughs> so it was, it was multi and I'm trying to think back. It was many years ago, but I think that was the, the main parts. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, yeah. they are concerned that if, what if we show a negative ROI? Well, you know what? That's your opportunity. Yeah. Right. That's the opportunity yeah. to improve. And you want to know it's negative before someone else does. So yes. let's, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, look in, let's look in the mirror and see what's going on and yeah. get it done. So, anyway. Yeah. I th- and I think that's a really important point, too. It's a really good idea to know what your data is telling you, because in addition to understanding it, that does give you an opportunity to react well to it, whether it is making adjustments, whether it's simply, you know, briefing your leadership and asking for more resources, more information, you know, a different integration for that program. Without that data, you can't correct anything. And I do think that that's an area where a lot of talent development professionals will sometimes have that misstep. They think that 
you know, the numbers might tell a story that they don't want it to tell, really, you might need that interpretation of it. That's right. And that's why it's sometimes yeah. helpful to have a third party help you out with it too, right? They, they're, they're afraid of what the data will tell. And then the other thing is they're afraid people won't believe it. They say, well, yeah. you, know, I've, you know, it's my program. I've evaluated the program. I've got a, you know, 110% ROI. Nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it may be helpful. Let's get somebody else in to maybe analyze the data reported out. I mean, there are things we can do, but those ten, that tends to be the fear. Um, you know, what are they going to say if, what are they going to do with my program if, are they going to believe me? Can mm -hmm. they take it if it's negative? All those things. But yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have to be that way. It's, it's all in how we, we think about it, you know, think about it in terms of process improvement and opportunity to do more for your people. And I think uh, too, Chris, your question actually got me thinking. I think there are a lot of people out there who are afraid of it, whether it's the numbers, whether it's what the data might tell them. For a talent development professional who's starting to get serious about ROI, what do you recommend as far as first steps? How do they start to orient themselves with what they should be paying attention to, make the, you know, begin the conversation with their teams, maybe even prepare to make the case to leadership if necessary? Where do, where do you find people typically begin? I think the first thing that people should do is if, if they know nothing about it, they're and, and we do, right? I mean, there, you know, or others, but we do it, right? We are doing webinars all the time. Spend one hour and go listen to Jack, listen to me, listen to some of our associates, just kind of listen and understand what it is. Um, you know, the whole seek to understand is important. Just go, mm. you know, what is it? What, what is it not? I think that's a first step. And the other thing is to really look at your programs and your projects. You know, what programs do you have that are big, expensive, that reach a large audience that are really investments in your people um, and then see what's out there because what you'll find is there's not that many. I mean, serious Pareto principle exists in talent development and if, you know, the 80-20 yeah. rule. So 20% of what we're delivering is driving 80% of the business impact. The rest of it is important, but it feeds the others, right? Their support, mm. their nice things to do for the people. There's about 20% of what we're doing that is really touching those business measures directly. That's your target for programming. And so sometimes when you realize that, now it's not so daunting because we often think, oh, I got to do ROI on everything. The other thing too is there are different ways of looking at ROI and success. We can look at it at a very macro level or we can look at it at the programmatic level. The macro level, that's that big data. That's that analytics. That's that, you know, sur the survey says if we do this, we're going to drive, you know, 10% net income. Those are macro studies. They inform. They say there's opportunity, but they do not tell you in what you should be investing. That is the beauty of evaluating at the program level because what we do at the program level really drives what we see at that macro level. And so when you kind of get away from, well, I can't do that analysis and no one's going to believe it and all this, don't worry about the macro. Look at the programmatic level and let's look at these programs as interventions to change. And we want to know first, why are we making the change? What needs to happen? What do people need to learn? Design the program around answers to those questions. And then all you do is collect a little data to see if you've gotten it done. So I think understanding it, you know, taking a look at programs, really recognizing that it's not as daunting. And then two, you've got ATD. You've got, you know, you guys run workshop. You've got workshops. You've got ATD. has got evaluating learning impact a beginner's program to evaluation. We've got measuring ROI, a two-day workshop. We at ROI Institute, we have a boot camp. It is, our, it is the easiest workshop, introductory workshop. So there are a lot of ways, but I think the big thing is just, you know, spend an hour, go learn what it is and not be so fearful of it. And yeah. um, of course, you can always come to our website and download whatever case studies are out there to see what people are doing. And I love how much of a resource y'all are for this because I've been looking at your work for, gosh, 25 years. <laughs> Great. Good. Yeah. So, like, hey, yeah. When, you wanna, when you're ready to do something new, come on. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know one of the um, common myths is, well, you, you can't do ROI for soft skills related stuff. 
I know. Yeah, what's your you. What's your response oh, to that? I laugh. I'm like, what? At first, what is a soft skill for crying out loud? What does that even mean? Soft. I, yeah. Soft, Thank soft, you. Soft. Nothing. The hardest thing to do is the soft stuff, right? I mean, are you kidding me? So true. But what? I, I don't get that. I I don't. Yeah. So I don't come out of talent development. I come out of the business. When I was in corporate, I was in a whole other area. So I was mm-hmm. a recipient of all this. Even then, I didn't mm-hmm. call what is called soft, soft, because yeah. what does it mean? Um, but when we hear that, we, we don't, we seriously don't laugh. Um, <laughs> not, in, not outwardly. We would though. never laugh in okay. front, at, at someone, but you know, we did kind of think, <laughs> we got to change, we got to work with ATD a little bit and change some things. Um, there you go. We, we look at them as core skills, essential skills, yes. but it's those things, those skills, they're driving hard data. Mm-hmm. And so what we always say is not, you're not, doing ROI on soft skills. You're doing ROI on the consequence of using soft skills because nice. that's what you're doing. So it's like leadership, you know, you're not doing the ROI on leadership development. You're doing the ROI on the consequence of leadership development. And that consequence is behaviors change. And mm-hmm. as a consequence of that, we see improvement in output quality, cost and time. Oh, I love it. And I'm going to take that answer and use it. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Please do. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Chris, because I, I do feel like a lot of people get into that headspace of, well, we, yep. can't, we can't work with ROI in this way. There's no way to yeah. do it. There's definitely a way to do it in essential skills. I won't even call them by the other term. Essential yeah, I skills. I love are essential exactly skills. Exactly that. Well, I always, exactly. Go back to, I always go back to growing up. You know, my household. If two things going up, girl, I'm right where I need to be because as a kid, two things happen. First, my, my dad was always asking us, you know, he said, oh, yeah, what'd you get done today? And so we talk about all the activity. I did this, this, and this. He goes, that's not what I'm asking. I don't care what you're doing or what you do. I want to know what did you accomplish today? Mm. And then the other thing is my mother was always telling us, can't, never could. So when people tell me that they can't show our wife or soft skills, it always <laughs> comes back to me, can't, never could. <laughs> Give it a shot. How do you know? We got 110 books that say you can. So let's see if we can't get it done. Yeah. That is fantastic. And I, I am a huge supporter of that philosophy. Absolutely. And I know you have the ROI methodology, and I feel like we would be just completely remiss if we didn't spend a couple of minutes learning a little bit about what that methodology looks like. So I'd love it if you could give us just the very high level of what it is. I think that'll also help to inspire some people to think about how they might be able to use it. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, There's really five components to it. There's the framework of data. And so anytime we're doing any evaluation or research, you need a framework of data. And that's just the way we categorize the data. So that's your inputs, reaction, learning application, business impact, ROI. So we start with that framework, categorizing like measures. We have a process model, 12 simple steps to ROI. We want a process model because process models tell us exactly what we're going to do. And they help us explain exactly what we did once we've done it, we have as it includes a set of standards. The standards ensure we execute the process consistently so that the data in the framework are reliable. The fourth component is also the case study. So we work very hard to publish case studies because people need to see what's really going on with this. So it's putting a theory to practice. You know, you can have a framework, you can have a process, you can have standards. If you're not doing anything with it, it's just sitting on the shelf. So implementing it, those case studies are really important. But the fifth uh, part of the process is this implementation or the seamless integration. You can have framework and process and standards and do all the ROI studies, the impact studies, the 360 feedbacks, the level two. So you can do all of that. But if you're not using the data, it is just another activity. And so that seamless integration, that implementation is critical. And we spend a lot of time working with organizations on that because the value of measurement, the value of analytics, the value of research is in what people do with it and the consequence of their doing it. Yeah. I love that. I just did there. I, and I think that's just across the board. We have, we capture so many analytics yes. and Stephanie, I can't remember. We had someone on, on big data anyway. Uh, and they were talking we about did. just we the amount of data that we have available at our fingertips that we're not using. 
that yeah. we could be using. It's just Gosh. amazing. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. We look at the data and all the metrics and everything that out there. It's huge. Um, but it gets back to, you know, the why, the how and the what. Mm-hmm. Why do you want it? Why do you need it? Why are you doing what you're doing? How are you going to do it? How are you going to use it? How are you going to measure it? What is it telling you? What is it not telling you? So if we just think of it like that, you know, we can sometimes scope it down. But yeah, you, there's any number of things you can measure. But why? Why do you want to do it? And more is yeah. not better. More is just more. <laughs> yes. So you know, <laughs> That's a, it's a conversation I have with organizations pretty regularly. You can collect all the data you want, but it's useless and maybe even a waste of time if you don't do anything with it. So yeah. only collect that data that you're going to be using and really think about what data you actually need. Exactly. When you're looking at that questionnaire, look at those, look at the questions, don't just scan them, look at them, say, now I'm going to use this when they respond. First, can they even respond? Because we could have a whole other session on how to write a survey, right? We should do that. <laughs> That'd be a good one. Can they <laughs> Semester class. To that? Yeah. Right. But then also, how am I going to use the information from it? If you just look at it, you can see on that, you know, end of course evaluation, we have 20 questions, like 15 can come off because you can't do anything or you're not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, before we get to our rapid fire, is there anything else you think our listeners need to know about ROI? Well, sure. But, you know, I don't know that you're going to let me have that much airtime here. So, <laughs> no. High level. Think, is there- <laughs> high, very high level. I think the most important thing is, you know, ROI is a critical part of what we do. And demonstrating the value in those terms is really important. Knowing that it's only one measure of success, but recognizing the importance of it in the context of those other measures is critical. And just don't be afraid of it. because. Yeah. We've been doing this for so long. And I know a lot of people say, yeah, it's easy for you. You've been doing it. No one says that it's not always easy for us. So I'm not going to say it's easy, but it doesn't have to be as scary and daunting. And then also know you're never going to get it perfect. There's only one objective thing in the universe, and that is math. One and one is two, unless you want to be wrong. The next question is, from where do the one and one come, right? So there's always subjectivity. There's always gray area. You're always going to mess up. There will, every case study, every ROI study, every evaluation you do, there is someone out there who can find fault with it. Don't worry about it. Let's get it done. Yeah. And there's, like you you said earlier, there's so many resources available for this. Oh, so many resources. And, you know, please come to our website download them. And if you can't find it, you contact us because we either oh. have it or we can create it very quickly because we've just, this is what we do. Yeah. Oh, I, I love, love it. it. I do. Okay. Ready for rapid okay. fire? Yeah. We're not quite <laughs> done with you yet. <laughs> so at the end of every episode, we do some rapid fire questions. They're not too hard or are they? <laughs> Just kidding. But they require a, a, a short response. So no more than about 60 seconds for each one. Are you ready? Okay. So what is a book you'd recommend to everyone and why? Okay. So again, Rabbit in the Briar Patch. We just came out with this book, Show the Value of What You Do. I mean, it is hot off the presses, T. Yeah. And we wrote this book. Um, not to teach ROI so much. I mean, it says you'll learn how to do things, but that's not the intent of the book. The intent of the book is to talk about and to share with people that it's just not that hard. And it gives a lot of examples, a lot of stories. So they're not the detailed technical case studies. Mm. Um, They're the stories. Here's what people are really doing. And it's real stories really happen. But the intent is to get people just thinking ROI. We just want to change the thinking around ROI. And we also want to get it into the hands, not only of uh, corporate professionals, but those independents out there, the independent workers, because they need to show the value of what they do. And they may not have big programs, but even the work they do has value. So get the book, you go to Amazon, or if you will send us an email, you can email me. You can email Andy Vance at our office. Um, we'll certainly sell it to you for 10% off the Amazon price. So Ooh. either on Amazon, oh, come wow. to us. But yeah, we'd love for you guys to have it and, nice. and take a look at it. So Thank again, it's you. just about changing the mindset. 
Nice. So uh, what I would love to see is the next book being the uh, ROI for your life, because I think it applies to everything. <laughs> it, it, oh, yeah. doesn't it? it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> A little plug there for your next book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is one tool you can't live without? And tool can be interpreted in any way you see fit. So it's any tool, right? Okay. Any tool. So any. My all, so I am sadly one of those shiny object people. I buy a lot of Me stuff. Too. So yeah, no, I'm shiny <laughs> object. But the one tool um, that I was introduced to is my remarkable. <gasps> Do y'all have one of these? Oh my yes. gosh. Oh, it's, it's in the other room. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> I, this is the only thing I have bought tool wise that I actually use consistently. I love it. I get that. Yeah. It's great. Yes. That's it. I have it too. I use it every day. I, I, I tell everyone about it. It's like here. Yes. Yeah, so yeah that's my favorite tool. Oh, okay. What is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? Ever been given? Ever. Um, no pressure. Best piece of advice <laughs> ever given. And there's been so many pieces of advice I've been given. But the best piece of advice is don't take it all so seriously. Mm. You know, we are we live in a tough world. And you need to be serious. And you need to do serious work. But you know what? If you mess up, okay. Let's, you know, shake it off. Get up. Yeah. Let's move on. Oh, I love it. I think the world needs more of that. Yes. As a matter of no, fact. We are, we are. <laughs> We're serious these days, right? I mean, you're probably so intense. It's like, and there's some things you want to be. You There are some serious issues. I'm not discounting that, but seriously, mm -hmm. if you mess up in front of these, you know, if you mess up a workshop, if you mess up presentation, if you say something yeah. crazy, everybody does. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to say, sometimes when you mess up, you're also giving other people permission to not have yes. to try to be perfect. And sometimes the way you handle that can model what it can look like and other people aren't going to feel so bad the next time. So absolutely, it's always nice to be able to provide a little bit of support for someone else, even if it's through something like that. No, I, I love that. I think that's great advice. Perfection is so overrated, folks. <laughs> it is. It's that too, is one it's word. It's too hard. It is too hard. So yeah. it's and one it's word never I would attainable. Mind missing. Yeah, it's so, not. That's exactly yeah. right. It's, it's not so a, why bother? So why bother? <laughs> yeah, let's keep going. If we could if, if we could get rid of perfection and soft skills, I think I'd be that much closer <laughs> to just complete happiness. That's hilarious. <laughs> Patty, this has been a ton of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with us. We have really, really had a great time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. So, and seriously, if you ever guys want to talk about surveys, I am in. I'm in. I think we Yay. could have a good time with Going to need that on the calendar. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks and for having course, me. Oh, we are. We're thrilled you're here. And of course, many thanks to all of you in our community for listening. And before you go, we have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Are you a member of the Metro DC chapter of ATD? We have resources just for you. Go to dcatd.org and select the Members Only section of resources to access our digital library, member directory, and chapter documents. Want to network with other chapter members? Join the Metro DC chapter of ATD members on LinkedIn today.